Coming up on Need to Know, President Barack Obama has referred to climate change as the greatest threat to our future, more so than terrorism. A local look at the impact of climate disruptions in Monroe County and how environmental advocates say we can help make a difference. That's coming up next. Also on the show, a waiting list is growing for a local club. It's a place for storytelling, laughter, socializing, and a lot of reading. How a book club is bringing together a community and breaking stereotypes. And a tradition of mural making in Rochester City Schools lives on. We'll learn about area students continuing the work of a renowned artist referred to by some as a master landscapist. It's all coming up right now on Need to Know. The issue of climate change has a number of advocates and a fair share of skeptics. But however you slice it, several scientific agencies in the U.S., including NASA, agree that climate change is happening and we are contributing to it. How? According to some environmentalists, it's happening through deforestation, which is the clearing of forest trees to create clear land, and through the burning of fossil fuels. Both activities release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So what does this mean for you? Environmental advocates say a lot more than you may think. Joining me to break down the impact of climate change on everyday people and communities are Sue Hugh-Smith, co-leader of the Rochester People's Climate Coalition, Mark Dunley, president of Green Education and Legal Fund, and Tim McGowan, co-leader of Citizens Climate Lobby of Rochester. And welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So first for viewers who might ask, what does this have to do with me? How does climate change affect everyday life? And Sue, I'll give that to you. Well, people aren't aware that climate change is already impacting our area. The northeast part of the United States has had an increase in heavy storm events by about 71% since 1950. And what that does for us is, is it erodes our water quality because we haven't updated our infrastructure to handle the increased storm um, water. And, and I just wanna, I wanna get really to the basics uh, when it comes to this. How, how would you define climate change? We, we might hear that word uh, used in conversations, but maybe perhaps don't fully have a grasp of it. Mark, how would you define it, break it down? Well, one way to define it is that weather becomes more severe. And so when Hurricane Sandy roared up the East Coast because the ocean was warmer, the, the wind speed and the storm surge increase was much more powerful. Um, you know, we saw that in Europe uh, about 10 years ago where 70,000 people died uh, during a heat wave during the summer, mainly um, seniors. It's like a pendulum, and so sometimes it pushes it further out so it becomes too hot, and sometimes it pushes it the other way so it becomes too cold. We're, we're, we're sort of moving away from what was average, and the problem is a lot of our uh, agriculture system was yeah. was designed to operate within a certain parameters and now we're moving outside those parameters. And you touched upon warming and, and it's a word I want to also tie this in as well. I want to know what's the relationship between climate change and global warming. Prior to taping this you were talking about this a little bit Tim how studies have shown that uh, Americans maybe connect more to the word global warming as opposed to climate change. Talk about that connection the relationship. Sure it's a bit more accessible. I mean <clears throat> we can we know what warm and warmer is. So um, it's it's simply uh, more in range for people's uh, uh, perception. Um, global warming refers to a, uh, an increase in the temperature of the Earth as a whole. Um, temperature, though, is only one aspect of, of uh, climate change in a broader way. So climate change affects all kinds of systems. So precipitation, um, seasons, the length of seasons, uh, you know, obviously we're talking about sea level rise, etc. But, but so from a scientific point of view, um, 
from a systemic point of view, it's, it's more than temperature. Climate change is involving a range of Earth systems, mm. uh, and global warming is, is yeah. focused on temperature. Yeah. Kind of to add to that, like global warming is the increase in the average of the Earth's temperature, yeah. right? But how that expresses itself globally is variable. So because of wind patterns, because of ocean patterns, because those are shifting, um, some places get warmer, some places get colder, some place, places are just getting more chaotic. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported in 2013 that climate scientists are 95% certain that humans are the primary cause of climate change. I mentioned this briefly in, in the introduction to this segment, but explain in more detail how this is happening, how we're contributing to this, and how long this has been going on. Mark. Well, I mean, the Industrial Revolution is about two centuries old, and that's when we began to, to burn uh, fossil fuels. Um, even Exxon, 15, 20 years ago, understood what was happening, but they decided for business reasons to basically mislead the public. And it's very good that the New York State Attorney General is now investigating Exxon to see what, what responsibility they should bear for the amount of damage um, that has occurred by not telling people uh, about it. Um, it's like, well, it will be hotter more often, and so you'll have more heat waves. So instead of, you know, maybe six or seven or eight days during the summer, it will be above 90 degrees. Maybe that will be 20, 25, 30 times. Um, they actually, scientists are actually saying that parts of the United States by the end of this century, you will not be able to go outside for significant parts of the year. Surprisingly, uh, it'd be the Midwest because a combination of heat, um, but also moisture. And then in terms of how we're playing a part in it, what would you say and in and what, and, and what ways? Because I think this is key for people to be able to understand. Right. It really is the burning of fossil fuels. So coal and oil and natural gas. And the focus is especially in this country now on coal as a major generator of carbon dioxide. So the, the key piece that we're looking at here is, is carbon dioxide. And it's, it's becoming trapped in the atmosphere. Um, and so it's not radiating, it's not releasing as it normally would, um, the heat that's building up. So it's, it's kind of forming a blanket. Um, so the, the focus really is on, um, on the CO2 equivalent of coal and oil and natural gas as causative, as really generative of this range of, of phenomena that we're seeing. Right. Now, one of the groups I work with is 350.org, Bill McKibben's group, which is probably the best known climate group in, in the country. And they are named because if the parts per million in the atmosphere of carbon gets above 350, that's when you're gonna get the really severe climate change. And for the last year, we've been over 400 parts per million. And you know, Tim mentioned uh, carbon, but the reality is also that natural gas or methane, short term, is about 87 times worse than carbon. And so it's a real problem in New York State that New York State is actually building out the amount of natural gas we use because short term, that's more potent as something that's going to warm up the climate. So it was really good that Governor Cuomo said, no, we're not going to allow the fracking of natural gas, but really we have to stop natural gas overall, not just one extraction method. When the New York Times reports that the 10 warmest years on record have all occurred since 97, when President Obama says he's convinced that no challenge poses a greater threat to our future, future generations than climate change, why are there climate skeptics? Why do we hear arguments that this is a hoax, we can't predict these things, and, and other arguments? In your opinion, do you believe there's any truth to this, Sue? In my opinion, the science on climate change has been settled for a very, very long time. Um, we have historical evidence geologically of climate change, and, and there are many parallels to what we are doing um, to what's happened in the past as a result of natural uh, causes, but we know we can eliminate those natural causes from being the reason for the change today. Okay, so there's lots of data, there's lots of evidence that shows that it's our behavior, our deforestation of mostly in the tropics right now, and our use of fossil fuels that is increasing the amount of carbon that's in the air and that keeps heat in. So it's absolutely certain that it's caused by, by people in our behaviors. And let's remember that Unfortunately, the United States is probably the single most guilty party in terms of causing climate change. 
And there's really only one country on the planet where there's any climate denial, and that's the United States. This issue does not get debated in the rest of the planet because it's, it's very well settled. And that is why the New York State Attorney General is investigating Exxon. They lied, mm -hmm. knowingly, in order to protect their future business interests. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that interests that want to continue to burn fossil fuels have funded scientists to promote the skepticism, yeah. but the rest of the planet does not allow that type of misinformation. In, in addition to the U.S., I would say China as well, correct, in terms of, of the guilty parties, if that's, you want to use that phrase. Yeah, but it's just the, the per capita, the amount of pollution per person is so much higher in the United States because mm -hmm. places like India and China are bigger, they are contributing. Right now, probably India is going to be the biggest problem because they're using the most coal, you know, moving forward. Mm -hmm. But th th there's also the, the problem that, you know, the United States has most benefited from the industrial revolution. We have the best, you know, in terms of G gross national product. And a lot of the other countries are saying, well, you have wrecked havoc on the planet in order to develop your economy. Now, if we need to not follow that path in order to avoid climate change, then you must compensate us and, and help our community, our people, increase their standard of living um, because you have basically taken the, the whole carbon budget and used it for North America. I mean, I, I just want to respond to your yeah. earlier question as well <laughs> in terms of why people um, seem to persist in either denial or, um, and you know, it, it obviously can be for a number of reasons. It can be for, you know, uh, political reasons in terms of ideology. It can be, it can be out of fear. Uh, the stuff can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it can be out of kind of a, a, a chosen, um, for lack of a better word, a chosen ignorance to not look at the science or to not engage in the information that's coming out on it. Um, so it's, it's complex. I think the key thing here really is to take responsibility as individuals, as families, as communities, as a nation, and as a species. And, and how do we do that? And how do, I, I'm interested in how we, yeah. as a community here, how do you mobilize uh, individuals to, to do just that, to take responsibility with something like this? Yeah. I think the first thing is people need to learn. People need to be open to exploring information on what's happening and what the science is, what the implications are, and what it means for us as individuals, as families. Um, so the first piece really is opening up to mm -hmm. this is this is really happening. Um, the, the second piece comes into uh, looking at, again, fossil fuels and especially carbon footprints. So what is my carbon footprint? And by that I mean how much you know, uh, carbon uh, am I leaving as a result of my purchasing decisions and my lifestyle? Um, so looking at, at household uh, reality in terms of uh, is my home properly insulated? Um, you know, am I, am I, uh, what kind of uh, mileage am I getting from my car? I mean, uh, and then finally, um, people need to become active because it, it doesn't happen um, just by individuals or small. We need all to take responsibility for the future for our kids and our grandkids. And I say the last point is the most important because we cannot individually solve the problem and we need mm -hmm. to move to 100% renewables. Mm -hmm. It is cheaper, it is healthier, uh, and it gives the planet a future. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no reason and not it, it to do it. It is cost effective. It oh, is cost It would so lower like, mm -hmm. electric rates by 50% compared to continued reliance upon fossil mm -hmm. fuel. In New York State, an estimated 3,000 people die annually from the burning of fossil fuels. Well, Tim McGowan, Mark Dunley, and Sue Hughes-Smith, I thank you for your time and for your insight on this issue. And you can learn more about the causes and impact of climate change and its effect on our agriculture, human health, poverty, infrastructure, and much more. Check out the websites on your screen, citizensclimatelobby.org, rochesterclimateaction.org, and gelfny.org. The barriers are immense when it comes to individuals with disabilities seeking employment. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, 17 percent of people with a disability were employed in 2014. That's compared to nearly 65 percent of individuals without a disability. One of those barriers to the labor force is a lack of certain educational skills. 
Tied to that, for some, is a lack of literacy training. But a local book club connected to a national book club movement is not only tearing down some of these barriers, but also breaking stereotypes and building a sense of community for adults with developmental disabilities. Joining me to share more about the arc of Monroe County's book club are club participants Joe Hill and Damon Thomas, along with Tiffany Ho, a speech language pathologist for the arc of Monroe County. And I appreciate all of you being here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. You're welcome. So just to begin, Tiffany, I understand yes. that you're essentially the major force behind this club, and it's something you began researching uh, while at the University of New Hampshire. Correct. So I'm curious to know at the time, what were you hoping to develop and, and why and how did it morph into a book club? So um, I've always, first, of, first and foremost, always loved literacy, always been interested in literacy, especially with this population. Um, when I was at the University of New Hampshire, I was asked to be involved in this leadership program. Um, and as part of our charge within the leadership program, um, we were asked to develop an action plan to utilize some of the resources and tools uh, that we were provided. Um, uh, to build more community inclusion and experiences for this population. And um, so I thought, here's my chance to tie in literacy and um, develop an inclusive book club. So I had this whole action plan. And when I came to the ARC, um, it just seemed like the perfect venue to launch something like this. Good. Well, I'm curious to know, so Joe, when you first heard about this book club and, and this opportunity, what were your thoughts? What were you thinking? Well, with my thoughts was that uh, I enjoy book club yeah. and things like that. When the, when I go out on the bus with with David and stuff like that. So in terms of the, the aspect, the, the idea of socializing and meeting new people and reading, it sounds like it was, it was pretty much a slam dunk. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fun, but you mean people get coffee, it's like Nancy and Wade books. Nice, very good. And, and were you interested, I guess, were books and reading, was it something that you enjoyed doing prior to book club, or did this kind of, would you say, increase your interest even more? It's more delicious. It increased it even more? Yeah. What about for you, Joe? Well, it's like that I do more things where I do stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing I want to find out, I, explain, I want you to explain just a little bit, Tiffany, the sure. importance of creating a way to support literacy opportunities for people served by the ARC. And for those watching who might say, well, aren't, aren't these types of skills, aren't they something that, that we get early on uh, in our educational career? Right. How would you respond? Um, you know, I think for a lot of these folks like Damon and Joe, when they're going up through the school system, a lot of the emphasis is placed more on like, you know, physical needs um, and maintaining medical needs and, and those kinds of things. Um, less emphasis on, you know, the literacy and um, other educational skills. Um, now with, you know, reform and um, we're seeing more and more of these folks, you know, joining the communities. Um, and and I take the bus off there too. Exactly. So you take you know, the bus so, then to right. get there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, taking the bus, yeah. um, living in, residing in local neighborhoods, um, you know, with managed care coming up, we've got like more folks uh, entering the workforce. Um, and those are important skills to have you know, out, out in the community, out yeah. in the workforce. Um. And just and just to clarify, so this sure. is connected to uh, this national uh, book movement. Tell me, Next Chapter, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So Next Chapter Book Club um, originated out of Ohio State University Nysonger Center, headed by a gentleman named Tom Fish, um, and he designed the program based on a discussion about the prevailing assumption that you know adults with disabilities aren't seen and presumed as readers um, or pursuing lifelong learning. So. Um, you know, the program was developed to kind of uh, bring more of those experiences to these folks. So Damon and Joe, I want to get a sense of, for those who, who don't know what the experience is like, what happens? On, on, I know the, the book club operates twice a week. Just kind of break down what happens when you get there. Okay, we go in there, we get coffee, we people. I get a pop because when I go in there, I go, up there to get pop up here so I can have it for lunch. Nice. Good, good caffeine to keep you going too. 
Yo, it's a good kind of stuff that I like to drink to, to have, so, you know. Very good. And then in terms of when you're reading, are you reading individually? Are you reading with, uh, with your peers? How does it work? Well, I'm with my peers and I read with him. And for, how does it work for you, Damon? Uh, I read myself, I have to use the words. Right. And I want to know, for, for those, because I hear there's this waiting list for the book yes. club, what, what does that mean? I mean, that seems like a message to me uh, sure. for the community. I don't know if, if you would look at it the same way, yeah. but is that a message when you hear that people want to be a part of this and, and there's Absolutely. not enough slots available? Absolutely. I mean, um, when we develop the program, the hallmark of this program is that you don't even have to have literacy skills to be a part of it. You just have to have uh, an enjoyment of reading, um, you know, a desire to want to read, um, and uh, you know, an interest in, in going out and being part of the club. So um, we have facilitator, two facilitators that also come, which means we need staff and volunteers to help support the club. Um, so Yo, that's what we're because when. We need help to get help now. Right. So it sounds like now is, is a good time for volunteers Absolutely. to to jump on board and and, and contribute their Correct. time. Yes. And I want to be I want to clarify one thing. This sure. is this is so much more than just about reading books because as they both mentioned it, they're they're talking right. with people, they're meeting people, Absolutely. and you're also you're breaking barriers and stereotypes. And yes. I don't want if you can just kind of touch upon that a little bit in terms of how that's happening with this club. Sure. I mean I think you know when we're out in the community, we um, meet for example at Barnes and Noble Cafe, and the community members, you know, I'll see them come sit closer. Like, it's just something that they haven't seen before. And, you know, I think it's, again, breaking some of those presumptions of seeing adults uh, with disabilities as readers and changing people's perception of that. Um, so it's, it's a great thing. You know, our guys love interacting with the baristas and... <laughs> well, I always <laughs> interact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, they're you know, they're developing yeah. social relationships yeah. without, within the community as well, which is huge. Very good. All right, very good. Well, we look forward to hearing more. And again, a call to action, it sounds like, also for, for volunteers to step up. We've got that information available. So Tiffany Ho, Damon Hill, and uh, Joe Thomas, I want to thank you all for joining me and for your time. Sure. Damon Thomas, excuse me, excuse me, that's what I get for going too fast. <laughs> so if you'd like to learn more uh, about getting involved with the Arkham Monroe County's book club, call the number on your screen, 585-672-2202. You can also go to the website, arkmonroe.org. And this segment was part of WXXI's Move to Include. It's a partnership of WXXI and the Galasano Foundation working with the community to lead change toward the inclusion of people with intellectual and physical disabilities. And we want to hear your thoughts on what you just heard. So visit movetoincluded.org. Well, there's a chance that you spotted the work of renowned landscape artist and genre painter Carl Peters when visiting a Rochester City School. His murals date back to the Great Depression, when the federal government funded several art projects, including Rochester's Works Progress Administration, hosted by the Memorial Art Gallery. Peters, who, like other artists at the time, had trouble selling his paintings. So he enrolled as a muralist for this federal project. He painted 13 murals, most of which still exist in Rochester. Recently, the MAG partnered with students at Wilson Magnet High School to study Peter's works and to carry on his legacy. Check it out. My name is Suzanne Curtis. I'm the International Baccalaureate Visual Arts teacher here at Wilson Magnet High School in Rochester, New York, and I help coordinate the Carl Peters mural project. <laughs> so this here is the study that the students at Wilson Magnet High School made for their murals, which are in response to the Peters murals in their school. And their idea, I think this is entitled A, a World of Our Own, and the, the concept behind their mural was they were, they were 
responding directly to the Peters murals in their school as well as these um, murals in the school down the street from them in Wilson Foundation Academy is what we had always hoped would happen, that they could kind of bring this tradition of mural making and um, uh, leaving a legacy for future students as well. My name is Peck. I am one of the students who participated in creating the piece behind us. It's so much more extensive than just the painting process. We had to emulate a great artist, and that was Carl Peters. His technique is just so above our level, um, and through that, it just became so much more than just a painting. Carl Peters is really known as sort of a um, regional landscape artist. Um, you know, sort of beautiful winding streams going through snowy forests. What people don't really know about Carl Peters is that he, over the course of about seven years, from 1937 to 1942, um, he was painting murals for the WPA. Carl Peters documented all of his um, projects, so we thought that it was important to document ours. My role was to basically chronicle everything that we did when working on the mural. Like taking pictures and writing captions for the pictures and basically just writing the whole process. Technology was important to put into the mural because this society that we live in, majority of the people in it, uh, they base their lives off of technology. We try our very best to like include as much diverse city as possible. I think it has a pretty good demographic of the school. Technology, hope for the future, gay marriage, diversity. It was very important to them that they represented the diverse uh, student population that we have here at Wilson and that we have here in Rochester. So I think that they did a really great job incorporating all of that. When people are going to be looking at it 100 years from now, like we did for Carl Peter's work, we wanted them to know what we did and who we were. That story was brought to you by WXXI Television's Arts and Focus program. To learn more about arts and culture in the Rochester region, go to artsandfocus.tv. And that's it for this edition of Need to Know. I'm Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next week right here on WXXI Television.